And the first case study, I have my notes. Okay, the first case study is I want you to take note of the feelings that go through you when you hear the story, okay? So what is the story? The story is um, uh, a young woman came to me. Uh, at this point, she had, uh, she couldn't get uh, jobs and could, well, she couldn't stay in jobs. No? She couldn't get projects done. Um, and uh, she was very depressed, okay? And so I started working with her, and it was actually her mother who brought her to me. And so I said, can, can we deal with just one item in your life, one little incident that you believe uh, may be traumatic or uh, summarizes uh, a problem for you? And so she went into a series of drawings, and I'll show you the drawing, okay? Okay, this is her drawing. Um, okay, so take note of the feelings that you have, okay? So this is, uh, this is her at age eight, okay, in front of the computer screen, and I think she was doing an assignment for school, and she's in the living room, okay, just minding her own business, quiet house. Her dad is in the bedroom. She decides to enter the bedroom because she needs a book for her report, and she gets into the bedroom, opens the door, walks in, and lo and behold, her father's in there in shorts and this you know, t-shirt, pambahay, and there were lots of glossy magazines all over the bed and the floor. You know? Opened, and he was obviously reading. And what were the glossy magazines? They had pictures of nude men, okay? So eight-year-old kid walks into the bedroom, finds the father looking at glossy pictures of nude men. Okay, let me tell you about the father. The father's a psychologist, okay? Very well-known, uh, award-winning um, book writer, uh, works in, you know, UP or whatever, Ateneo, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and lo and behold, you know, daughter walks in, sees this, and she's eight. So what, she's, what does she do? No? She, she panics. And she doesn't know what it is. She just feels there's something wrong. And she says, I, I didn't know, but why, why all the nude pictures? So she goes to the dresser and pretends to look for a nail cutter. Okay. Okay, so she takes the nail cutter and then acts very nonchalantly and walks out of the door feeling very confused. And the father is there just watching her standing by the foot of the bed, glossy magazines all over. And so she sits back at her computer and is stunned. She says, I, know, I don't know what I did, I just sat there. And I was staring and I don't know what happened and I don't know how I felt. Or I just knew there was something wrong. No? So she said, I pretended to continue my work. No? And the father comes out of the bedroom, walks up to her, and what does he do? He just puts his hand on her shoulder and squeezes the shoulder, her shoulder a bit, and then walks away and back into the bedroom. And so she doesn't know what to do. She goes out and plays pico. You know what pico is? The, the, you know, the thing where you throw the stones. And, um, and she feels weird. She says, I don't know what happened. I was confused. Why did I feel weird? No? She had no language to it. And that evening at dinner, the father was there, being his usual self, very jolly, storytelling, and acted as though nothing happened. And from that day on, up until the time of his death, no? uh, and she's an adult now and all that, he never talked about it. They never talked about it. Okay, so, um, okay, game. S certain feelings. 
What did you feel at any point of the story? Shame. Shame. Okay. Maybe. Anything else? Did Did you ever feel confused? Okay. Okay. Ano pa? Anger? No. No. Okay. Not so much. So shame and confusion. Okay. So. How do I deal with my clients? No? Um, I have clients who come to me with cancer, with Parkinson's, uh, people who cannot hold on to jobs, people who say, what next with my life professionally, um, people who keep going in and out of relationships, nothing works. And I'm sitting there, and this is a stranger, and how do I connect? How, do I, how can I help them? No? And I start with empathy. Okay? So, Empathy, genuine empathy, this is my quote, only because Danella asked me. <laughs> so I needed to make a quote. So genuine empathy is tricky, very tricky. You have to truly care enough to want to fit someone else's shoes and understand her perspective, but also objective enough to pull back and view that perspective within a larger context. Okay? So maybe I don't have a father who's a closeted gay man. No? But certainly when I talk to this client of mine, when she tells me I felt shame or I was confused, you know, then I go into my own biography and I think of a time where I was confused. Okay? So maybe I was confused at a time when um, uh, I, I was at a test, taking a test in college, and the professor gives me an item that he did not teach. Okay? So I'm looking at the test, and I'm confused because I thought I was really ready, and pum, there's, a, there's an item that came from nowhere. So I get into that feeling of confusion, okay, my own confusion, and then I make an intensity range, just for myself, in my head, okay. The test, maybe intensity in terms of uh, confusion would be about three, okay. And then I look at my client, and I think eight-year-old, a child going into a room with glossy nude pictures and the father's looking at it, okay, oh my God, that sounds like an intensity nine, okay? So that is how I connect. I first go into, I hear the experience, and then I go into my own self, and I go into my own little catalog of, uh, of feelings. And it's very important for me to name, name the feeling, name the, name the enemy. No? name the dragon, and when I'm able to name the dragon, then I say, okay, how do I feel about that? When did I feel like that? And then I am able to empathize with the, with the client. And so if it's a cancer victim in front of me, you know, cancer is an illness, it's a physical illness, but in our language, all illnesses, siempre, except environmental, if you live in a very polluted area like Makati, <laughs> um, then that's a different case. But most illnesses really have its root in um, an unprocessed feeling or issue or concern that you've carried all throughout these years. You keep suppressing it, and somehow it suppresses itself again and again. You keep rationalizing it, and boom, it becomes a physical um, manifestation into cancer. Yeah? And so I have a lot of that. And day in and day out, I have to deal with people who bring me their problems. And I go into my card catalog of, of problems and say, how does she feel really? Okay. And that way, I'm able to put myself into someone else's shoes. But at the same time, I can step back. I'm not going to cry. I, there's another therapist friend who cries first before the client. <laughs> You're not supposed to be crying. <laughs> you know? You're supposed to be helping the client. So, so, so it's one thing to empathize, okay? But, and then what? Where do you take that empathy, okay? So number two question, okay? Number one is what is the, the client feeling and how do I attach myself to that feeling and understand it? Number two would be, okay, now I have a, I know the dragon, I know the name of the enemy. What is my intention? Intention is everything. Um, what do I really want to do? That is why I want to empathize. Do I want to help her through this process in life? Do I want to manipulate her? Um, 
Kasi sa, sa ads, marami siguro sa inyo nasa ad, ad industry, no? Um, you get to know your market, you empathize with your market because you want them to buy Coke or you want them to buy cigarettes. No? So the intention is very, very important. Well, I hope your intention for empathizing is for healing and for the good, the common good, no? uh, but I don't know you. But um, uh, I think that it, that should be all our intentions would be for nation building, for helping the other. Um, so when I am able to find out, okay, my intention is this, then I can work with the client. And my, my, my task is to journey with the client. So I'm literally, ay, nako, I take only very few one-on-one -on -one clients because every day when I wake up, I remember, okay, what exercise did I give so-and-so client? If that exercise I ask that client to do, I have to do it myself so that we're on the same page. Because this is a journey, and that is empathy too, of going with him until he's okay. okay? So this is Sister Ludi. I visited her at her convent in uh, Fairview. Um, she's a nun, and uh, at this point, she's 80, 80 years old. When she came to me, she was 77. No? And it was her doctor who sent her to me. The, um, the problem she had was she had Parkinson's disease. And so her muscles were now starting to stiffen up. She could barely walk. No? Um, and I had this very uh, traumatic childhood with nuns. <laughs> Does anybody have that, <laughs> that same experience? Then you can empathize with me if you've had a uh, Catholic education. Okay? And so when the doctor said, I'm sending to you a nun who was mother superior. <laughs> you know, I said, I think that's traumatizing for me, you know. Um, and so this woman comes out of the, the taxi, you know, she comes to my office, and she can barely walk from the taxi to my first floor. You know? My office is on the fourth floor. But because she couldn't walk up the stairs, I, um, I brought down my materials and used a portion of the first floor. And so she was um, very, very, little voice, very soft-spoken, um, could barely walk uh, without, without help. And then she, uh, she says, um, uh, I'm starting to forget things, you know. But Parkinson's is primarily first what goes is your muscle control. No? And then slowly it creeps up also to your mind, okay. So um, I use watercolor painting and this is watercolor painting of her rainbow this is sister ludis rainbow and um, the rainbow a painting of a rainbow tells me a lot already it's diagnostic for me okay so i was looking at at her and how she painted you can see all the splotches because her hand was shaking huh? and so she couldn't control the brush very very well and i was looking at it and i was saying hmm very little orange uh, a lot of colors are missing, uh, no greens, um, no violets. And, and I didn't know what to do with that, you know, but I keep it stored in my head. And with the orange, I said, um, sister, can we try orange? No? So I asked her to paint orange. And so she painted a full page of orange and then she says, I like that. No? And it was just orange, there was no forms. I like that. I said, okay, so sister, can you paint orange every day, you know, at home? And she says, okay. One of her main problems was constipation, okay? Um, she had to take laxatives and things like that. Uh, this is not grossing you out, I hope, okay? <laughs> so, so after a week of painting orange, you know, her doctor calls me up and says, Sister Ludi says she doesn't need the laxatives. What have you done? I said, I gave her orange. <laughs> because orange is actually for digestion, okay? So, if you look at papaya, diba? when you're constipated, you eat papaya. You eat orange, the fruit, kasi fibrous eh, no? So it makes sense that the color orange works like the fruit. No? It's like, wow, that's fantastic. I'm so excited about orange, you know? Um, colors excite me. <laughs> and, then, um, and so I was going through different colors and then, 
she didn't want to talk. She was very stern, unsmiling. No? And I said, God, I'm really being punished for all my feelings against the Catholics. You know? so, <laughs> so, um, so what happened was serendipity walks in. You know? And I'm so glad there's a universe that helps therapists. Because on the second day that she came, I wrote a book with my co-siblings. And this is a book about I, this is a shameless plug um, about martial law and our experiences under martial law because my family was, um, was very much affected, arrested, and tortured under the Marcos regime. Okay? But that's another story. So the, the time that she went, uh, I had all this stacked up because I was going to have my book launch. You know? And she goes, what is this book? You know, he not smile. What is this book? And and I said, Oh, sister, it's it's a book about martial law. My family wrote it. And then she says, Can I buy one? Okay, okay. So I sold her one. And then um, and then the following week, lo and behold, she says, I have exactly the same experiences. I went into a breathing exercise with her. The breathing really helps to to relax her. And then I said, Let's imagine a safe place. You know. And the safe place turns out to be real, because it can be imaginary, it can be real. And her safe place was a bahay kubo, no? and she painted this. Um, and I said, um, sister, that's a safe place? And she says, yeah, that's my home. That was my home in uh, Aurora province in 1984, I think. And, and then she started talking. This was a woman who didn't want to talk. And then she says, well, like your book, you know, I was sent to Aurora province, and what, what was her task? When she was 42, her congregation sent her to Aurora, Aurora province to create um, a, a church group no? to help the church. But everyone she organized, all the, the young men and young women who were studying catechism and church songs, the military said were organizing for the NPA, no? so for the communists, which wasn't true. So one by one, the people in her core Choral in her in her choir were disappearing, and then they would be in the stockade or they would be dead. And her role was to go to the military to try to find out if the boy was still alive and to try to get the boy dead or alive back to the back to the the parents. No? And so she went through a her horrendous story that was really a book in itself. No? And then she says, but I never told anyone about this. And she's 80 now, so it's like 40 years. No? And I said, why is that? Because the other sisters really did not care. My life was in, in danger, so after escaping from that very militarized area, I went to Manila, only enough time to pack my things, and they shipped me to our congregation in the US. And of course, when she was in the US, nobody understood what the Philippines was going through. So she suppressed it a lot. Huh? And, um, and it was because seeing my book and reading it, then she says, finally, somebody who can empathize with me, somebody who will understand. And so our 10 sessions were, I was just sitting there. She would paint. Um, I would give her healing stories. And my healing stories are very simple. They're Grimm's fairy tales, um, the original, huh? not the Disney version. I hate that. Okay, <laughs> so um, so the original version, which is very very archetypal and very healing. So I gave her the book and I said, Sister, every night paint orange and on the orange draw a picture that you remember from the story. Doesn't matter what picture. And so she would do that. One story was the singing bone, no? and it, the story was a very simple story. There was a little boy um, uh, who was. Uh, I, I don't quite remember the Grimm's tale, but the little boy was on a bridge no? and had witnessed something, something really bad. No? So the, the robbers or whoever the bad men were in the story decided to kill him and threw him over the bridge. And there he, his body was covered with shrubs and eventually uh, all that was left was his bones. No? And suddenly, years, years, years later, somebody was crossing the bridge and was hearing a song from under the bridge. And the song said something like, the mayor's men killed me. The mayor's men killed me because I had seen something that I shouldn't have seen. And so, um, and from that, from the, the singing bone, they found the bone of the boy that was singing the tale of how he was killed. And they were, they were able to, to catch the perpetrators. No? 
So sister picked out this story and she painted this. Huh? Uh, she's no artist. Uh, in fact, I love it when people are not artists because I'm not one myself. Huh? And it's easier to read, actually. <laughs> so um, she was painting the left side, she said, was the truth, but it, it had all sorts of like um, uh, rationalizations and lies attached to it. So half-truths. No? Whereas the singing bone just told the story as it were. No? So just the three stripes like that. And so she, that's what she told me. She gave me names. She talked about Enrile and what Enrile's men did in the province. Sorry uh, if there are any Enrile's here. But, um, but she was basically, I, I, I'm also, also a journalist, so I was torn. No? Will I be a therapist now or a journalist? But it was a wonderful tale that she was telling me. And everything came out. And more and more, her doctor would say, Susan, she doesn't need the laxatives anymore, you know? not even the tea. What are you doing? And I said, more orange, you know? But what was happening really was that she was not able to process her experiences. She couldn't digest her life. And the orange was actually processing it for her, okay? The painting of the orange and actually the articulation, the, the storytelling. And she says, the singing bone is like me, you know? I'm old and nobody wants to listen to me, but I know stories and I know who killed who, you know? Like, whoa, okay. So, <laughs> so um, uh, the, uh, by, the end, by the ninth session, you know, she told me, where is your office again? I said, well, it's on the fourth floor, sister. Well, on session 10, I will walk up to the office, she said. You know? and, and she did. The next time, the, ne the next week, she came and she says, we're going up, you know, she was leading me. And I visited her last year, you know, and she was 80 already, and she was walking through, you know, up to the fifth floor without holding the handrail and walking faster than me, really fast. You know? And I said, sister, you hold the handrail, you might fall. No, it's a matter of will, she says. I have to fight Parkinson's, diva. Right? And she says her hand stops when she paints, the hand stopped shaking. No? And I said, so what do you do when it shakes? I do that and I said, no, you will not win over me. You know? And um, I don't know how, how, how much you know about this, but I think last year there was the compensation bill for martial law victims. No? And um, I was also very active in that campaign, kasi nga, kami din yun, eh, no? Shameless plug again. Okay, but um, the, uh, when I remembered her story, I went back to her, and this time I brought a lawyer from a human rights group. And I said, you have to come hear this sister, you know? And then she was telling her story, and because of her stories, they were able to locate the victims in Aurora and have them file. Diba? Amazing. Diba? And she felt so good because her, her stories were not... Um, we're not useless, Sige. Uh, you, you can cut me anytime, I'll just finish the next story, Sige. The next story is, okay, uh, I don't know if when, the reason I'm here is a friend and a client, Gwen Kalubayan, um, he has friends who's, who's friends with the Creative Mornings, but anyway, Gwen Kalubayan, and I can use his name because he said I could. Um, he, um, he's uh, an award-winning, he was one of the 13 artists, no? Uh, ng CCP, and then also Ateneo also gave him awards. So he's this super, you know, um, his painting last week on auction sold for, a for 500 pesos, for half a million, one painting. Huh? And then uh, at Sotheby's, um, uh, or yeah, Sotheby's sold his painting for $20,000, one painting, okay? So he has it made in the, in the art scene, diba? Right? And he was coming to me, and saying, I need therapy. And I said, what's, what, this is an artist, multi, you're coming to me, I have no art whatsoever in my body, I'm just a therapist. And he says, but you're an art therapist. I know, but I'm ashamed, you know, I was, I was saying no to this guy. And then uh, I said, um, but okay, Sige, let's do two sessions first. So we did two sessions. And then I was going through his biography and all that, and then I said to him, after two sessions, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not sick. You have no issues. You're very grounded. Um, go home. You have no problems, I said. You know, you don't need me. And then he says, my problem is not that. 
um, my art is out there. It's very, you know, it's I can tell any gallery I want an exhibition. They'll, gi they'll give me a one-man show easily. Um, Ateneo was giving him the whole gallery, the whole first floor of the former Rizal Library, which is a huge space, like, like you know, six times this size. And it was only going to be his exhibit, okay? This was in February. And he said, and I have nothing to paint, you know? And I said, what is your problem? I cannot paint. I do not know where to go in terms of my work. And I said, well, can't you just have Parkinson's? I can deal with Parkinson's <laughs> cancer. <laughs> cancer, depression, depression. I can deal with depression. And then, <laughs> Tita, I just need to paint. So, so again, I said, okay, okay, no? So I asked him to do the painting of the rainbow. No? And this is his, of course, he finishes it in five minutes. And then I look at it, and I said, do another one and then do another one. So he did three. And I said, Buen, look at it. You don't have green. You don't have orange. You don't have, um, well, you have a little violet, but you're missing two complementary uh, uh, secondary colors, no? the, the orange and the, um, and the, uh, and the green. No? And then I said, constipated ka ba? <laughs> Again, the constipation true. Oh, oh, he was getting so stressed he couldn't paint. Constipated siya. Sige, orange ka, orange ka din, no? And then I had problems with the green because the orange after a few sessions started coming out already no, in the rainbow. But the green did not want to come out. And in our language as art therapists, when you cannot, um, when you cannot connect with a the color, then there's, there's something wrong. No? There's a soul quality that's missing. And then Gwen told me, you know, Tita, I'm... I'm colorblind, no? He's an artist whose single painting, you know, is like 500,000 pesos, and he's colorblind. He says, not all, but certain colors, and green is one of them, you know? Like, <laughs> okay, thank you. So I said, how do you make green? How do you, I wanted him to. After this, I said, I want you to look for Grunewald's resurrection which is the picture there. Because I remember that that resurrection, it's a very dark slide, but there's a, a tint of green throughout the entire, um, the entire picture. No? And so when Buen did the resurrection, and this is his abstract version of it, suddenly there was green. He was able to see green now. He saw all the colors now. It's like, wow, we're ready. No? And then he says, pero tita, I still don't know what to paint. No? So I gave him a story of the golden key. The story is very simple. Um, in Grimm's, I, I thwart it a little bit, but the original one is that a little boy is digging for firewood in the snow. And as he digs, he thinks, I'm cold. I want to make a little fire before I go home. So he digs some more and finds a little key. And he says, if there's a key, then there's probably a lock that it opens. And he digs some more, and he finds a chest. And the little key, lo and behold, fits into the lock, and the lid opens. And what are the wondrous things inside the box that the boy finds? And that's how the, the story ends. Bitin, diba? It's an open-ended story. So I said, when you are the boy, and I want you to draw the box. No? So first painting up there, the brown one, the box is closed. Second painting, the box is already flowers growing out of it, you know, on the sides because it's been in the earth for so long. And then when he opened it, there was I go, what's that? And he says, Tita Liwanag. No? Me Liwanag, there's light inside the box. No? And we both get excited because we know that's the, that's the key for painting. That was what he was going to paint again. And so I said, OK, but what is Liwanag? That's still way too abstract. When you're a therapist, you look at all the signs. You know, what type of shoes the person is, is wearing, how he wears his color. Um, the, the she or he comb his hair, think very small things like that, you know, uh, is his hand, you know, uh, wrinkled or whatever. So with Buen, for three weeks, he was carrying this book, a history book, Passion and Revolution by Ileto. Has anybody read or seen this book? As artists, you should all. <laughs> it's a history book, but it's very, very interesting because he doesn't look at it like the usual history, you know, this happened on this date, the name of person, blah, blah, blah. But he treats it like people are doing this, but there are so many levels in the subconscious of the Filipino that was happening 
during that time. So it was a book about the Katipunan no? and the revolution under um, uh, Macario Sakai and Bonifacio and things like that. And so when he, when he brought it, that was one of my favorite books. I'm also a history freak. No? So um, I said, you're reading that. And I said, do you know that this author writes about Liwanag, about light? And then he, you know, you could see his face go, whoa, this is it. And I said, there's a part there that says, in Banahaw, in the caves of Banahaw, the Katupuneros go in. It's a whole ritual of cleansing. They go through the waterfalls. They go through very small crevices. And it's really da dangerous because you don't know if there's a snake that comes out. But in the end, they talk about Liwanag, finding the light after going through the darkness of the caves. No? And that is also what society has to go through. You have to go through the darkness to see the light. And I've done the caves in Banahaw uh, several times over no? because it's, it's just really um, a very, it's a pilgrimage. I'm not religious, but something happens to me when I'm there. So I said, you have to go to Banahaw and you have to find the light there. So he goes and I find him a guide. I mean, this is therapy, okay? We're not just talking. We're talking about going on trips, going to Banahaw, you know, reading history books. No, what is that? But, but I'll go where it needs to go. No? And so he's, and I said, I gave him a lecture about Banahaw, how holy this, the, the mountain is. And I want you to go to each spot where the guide takes you and go as a pilgrim, go as a katipunero. Walk the, walk the fire that the Katipuneros went through. And he did it, and when he came back, wow, he was a changed man. Huh? And we were talking in really abstract, abstraction, like what is light? Ano yung, what is light inside? What is the light that you have to ignite so that um, to heal the nation, to cause change, to go for real revolution, you know? So it was weird. We even went together to a class in Ateneo being taught by Vicente Rafael, this, this uh, historian who came from University of Washington. He was teaching at Ateneo for a semester. And I said, when you're going with me, you know? So therapy was also going to the lectures and, and you know, taking down notes and dis discussing the history and all that. And when everything was there already, he saw the colors and then he was able to paint. And this is. What this is his first Banaho painting. This painting is bigger than the screen, no? and it really jumps out. No? And this is another one. No? Medyo, um, not a very good picture, but basically, if you see this, um, this figure here, it's a man walking into one of the streets in Banaho headed for the mountains. And he said, Ako yan tita eh. no? Ako yan tita looking for liwanag. I'm looking for, for light. No? So what is empathy? Going back to empathy. Empathy is, is journeying with the person, huh? finding out um, about the person. And it's very hard because when you, it's always, um, I talked to uh, uh, an advertising director, huh? and I gave him a shell. And I said, draw the shell. And I, he says, oh, yeah, that's easy. Abstract na lang. No, 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 no. I said, draw the shell as is. Same size, same color. Nothing fancy, just the shell. You know? And he had such a tough time with it. You know? And then I said, just respect the shell for what it is. And then he says, but I'm also in the shell. Ah, this isn't about you. This is about the shell. So can you get out of your head for a minute? No, not everything is about you. No? Um, and the same thing, no? When I do therapy, it's like, this is not, a, like every five minutes I say, this is not about me, this is about the client. I will respect where the client is at, and then we will journey together. So it's just like that. That is empathy, no? You, you find somebody, you truly, if you really want to find out um, something about that person, do it hopefully with good intentions, not because you want to manipulate the person, but because you want to journey with the person. Thank you for, for coming, uh -uh. and I hope you learned something.